It's really uh, a great honor for me to be here and a great honor to be invited to present the oration lecture. Uh, uh, thanks for the uh, Asia Unity Hospital and thanks for Cyclops, uh, Cyclops team. I just I wanted to say that is the, I have two systems of Cyclops and since I got those systems, they are my favorite. I don't use other systems, only I use a, a Cyclops system. Uh, my background is uh, med medicine, uh, neurology, neurophysiology, ANT, audiology. I uh, recently, early in my career, I got interested in dizziness and I was looking for um, sober training programs, which makes me uh, a distinguished dizzy doctor because uh, when I was a neurology resident, I didn't find um, uh, it's enough what we learn in neurology to handle the dizzy patient. And also, I worked for two years as an ENT resident, and I didn't find that really that's enough. And uh, so I changed my career to audio vestibular medicine, which is a medical specialty in Egypt, uh, which requires a residency training program of at least three years. Um, then later on, I got more education and more training on audiology because I do believe that dizziness does not belong to one specialty. It is a specialty for interested people. And uh, anybody from a uh, proper background who is interested and willing to spend the time, effort, uh, and interest for uh, vestibular medicine or um, balance disorders, is a speciality for all the interested and motivated people. It was very hard for me to choose which topic to talk, especially as I see most of you are experts, you know very well in most of the topics and you have your own expertise and uh, your own research. So I um, chose something uh, which might be interesting, mixing the history, uh, the literature, uh, the morals and the values with the science and the knowledge. Uh, just I wanted to share with you that is, uh, this is, was one of, this is Indian book. Uh, I have pleased to read the Arabic version of it at the age of nine years. And I keep on reading it many times. And at my home, we have three copies of this one for my children. It's uh, full of uh, Indian wisdom. The best way to develop a foundation of knowledge in any field is to understand the historical development in that field. Um, this is Professor Robert Palo uh, from California, Los Angeles, United States. He's the author of the famous book, Clinical uh, Neurophysiology of uh, Vestibular System. And he inspired me for this uh, topic of presentation. Even, I just read his uh, recently published book, uh, Vertigo, Five Physician Scientists and the Quest for a Cure. Uh, and he uh, gave me the permission, full permission, uh, to use his materials and his information uh, in this presentation. Uh, interestingly, I wanted to say that the word vertigo wasn't very well known except after the famous movie of Alfred Hitchcock, uh, Vertigo. The sense of balance was one of the first sensory systems to emerge in evolution, but it was the last to be discovered. Let me to ask you, what is the basic function of the ear? How you know? That's correct answer, but how you know? Uh, he's correct, and this is simply they found that is the vestibular organs start uh, phylogenetically in the primitive species much earlier than the auditory or the hearing abilities. So the basic function of the ear is the vestibular or balance sensations. Until uh, 1861, the symptoms of vertigo was attributed to what is called cerebral congestion a disorder sought to result from overfilling of blood vessels in the brain. 
and it was treated uh, by bleeding, leashing, cubbing, and burning, which are hard to withstand the regimens. Uh, Scarba, I'm sure that you know him very well for the Scarba's Gangalion, uh, was a great uh, anatomist. Uh, he uh, described very well the anatomy of the inner ear uh, at this uh, time. Uh, and he entered the University of Padua in Italy at uh, age of 15, uh, graduated with honor at age of 19, published his first work at 20 years of age, uh, a paper titled Anatomical Observations on the Structure of the Round Wind of the Ear or Second Tympanum. Uh, interestingly to know, as an incredible and questionable act of homage to the great scientist, the head of uh, great anatomist Scarbas was removed and exhibited in the Institute of Anatomy, and his head is still up till now uh, exhibited in the museum at the Bavia University. If you look to these drawings, you, how many years ago, but he could really uh, uh, he could uh, show exactly the. Uh, uh, oh, I'm going back. A very detailed anatomy. And one of the interesting stories that he hired a painter, very famous painter at this time, his name Andreoni, and he looked him in the room until he finished his drawings. But you can uh, observe that is a detailed and accurate. A drawing of the inner ear structures uh, was published by Scarbas at 1789. The, let me to ask you why the vestibular system is named on anatomical basis. We have the auditory system names on its function or physiological basis. So why the vestibular system is named on uh, his anatomy because it's in the vestibular. Any answers? Simply because the scientists didn't know what is the function of these organs. They know it's, there is a system, but nobody knows what is the function. <coughs> Initially, they thought <coughs> it's most probably these semicircular canals are to help for localization for the sound. So the cochlea fills the sound, and these semicircular canals help in localization. So that's why the vestibular system is named anatomically, because at the beginning, scientists didn't know its function. Uh, Florence, you hear this or you read in the textbook, was one of, uh, he was a French uh, physician scientist, made the first experimental observations on the functions of the vestibular labyrinth by removing each semicircular canal in pigeons. After the semicircular canal was cut, he found anomalous head movement in pigeons and the hearing was not affected. This was the surprise because he thought that these uh, semicircular canals are also related to hearing, but hearing was completely preserved, but they observed that there is abnormal head movement in the pigeons. He observed that selective ablation of semicircular canal makes the animal head and the body tended to move in the plane of the damaged canal. For example, damage to posterior canal, the animal falls backwards. Damage of the anterior canal, the animal falls forward. Damage of the horizontal canal, animal turned around the vertical axis. And this is proved that the cochlea is the only inner ear part involved in hearing. You know what is the meaning of nystagmus? You know the origin of nystagmus word comes from where? First is the observation by Florence. This was the abnormal nodding head movements by his pigeons after removing the semicircular canal. And just to know exactly, this is the origin. It's a Greek word, which means nodding. And what happened, because this is a very, very nice to know, because nystagmus is, has a slow face and fast face. This is what happens when you feel sleepy. So your head, then you suddenly turn up. Your head slow, then suddenly. So it's very dis descriptive, especially for the slow and fast face of nystagmus. So this is the origin of the word nystagmus. Boros Barminier, a very well-known name in the uh, otology and vestibular field. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, 
this is a hospital, Hotel du Paris. I think it's still functioning. It's one of the uh, most ancient building which is still functioning as a hospital. And the wish of Menir was to be a professor in this hospital. But unfortunately, he didn't get the opportunity. We will see if he was lucky or not lucky because he, he couldn't be appointed as a professor in this uh, hospital. So he just accepted a position uh, to be the director of the Deaf and the Mute Institute in Paris. So, uh, and with his work as a director of the Deaf and the Mute Institute in Paris, he was able to uh, discover many uh, important facts uh, and the, to contribute uh, in the otology and the vestibular field. And uh, he got his reputation uh, from his opportunity being working as a director of the Deaf and the Mute Institute in Paris. So the hearing function of the inner ear was known for centuries, but its rule in balance and equilibrium was only discovered approximately one and a half centuries ago. Prosper Minier, 1961, was the first to note and the report that patient was damaged to the inner ear often had vertigo and hearing loss. As a director of a large deaf mute institute in Paris, it is not difficult to understand how Prosper Minier concluded that vertigo results from the disease of the inner ear. He undoubtedly saw many patients with a combination of vertigo and the deafness. Um, what was the difficulty faced by Menier is how to appreciate how controversial this concept was when he presented it. Menier noted that patients with vertigo and associated hearing loss often had a benign course, and aggressive treatment such as bleeding can be more dangerous than the underlying disease. Uh, he reported this in 1961, uh, and at that time this is, was considered heretical. How was the proof that vertigo comes from the inner ear? It, it has a story for a real case for, faced by Menir and reported by him. A young girl who had journey by night in winter, this is written by Menir himself, uh, on the boxy seat of a coach during the time of her catamania, which is uh, like a, a menstruation, became as a result of the severe cold completely and suddenly deaf in one ear, Admitted because of the continuous vertigo and vomiting, this supervened on the fifth day. At autopsy, Menier found that the brain and the spinal cord were completely normal, but he found the bloody exudate filling the semicircular canals. Based on this single case, he established correlation of vertigo to the inner ear. The case was most likely acute leukemia with hemorrhage in the inner ear. And interestingly, until 1950s, Menier disease was thought to be caused by hemorrhage in the inner ear. He was 60 years on January 1961 when he presented uh, his finding in front of the Imperial Academy of Medicine. And the title was Particular Kind of Severe Hearing Loss Resulting from a Legion of the Inner Ear. He wasn't brave enough to, to present it as a vertigo case. Um, then, but later in the same year, he wrote a full paper uh, published in the same year, a report on a lesion of the inner ear, giving rise to symptoms of cerebral congestion of apoplyptic type. Uh, this is, was the medical concept for vertigo at that time. It, it's the cerebral congestion of apoplyptic type. So here, uh, the first case of Meniere's disease reported by Prosper Meniere, a healthy young man would experience suddenly, without apparent cause, vertigo, nausea, vomiting, a condition of indescribable stress, drained his strength, his face pale and passed with sweat, proclaimed approach to collapse, lying on his back, he couldn't open his eyes without seeing the objects around him whirling in space. The slightest movement of the head increased the vertigo and the nausea. Vomiting started again as soon as the patient tried to change the position. The patient then began noticing loud noises in his ears, along with decreased hearing. First in one ear and then in both ears. 
Based on these symptoms, Minir concluded that it's the association of vertigo, tinnitus, and hearing loss were due to single disease. Minir and migraine, and I was uh, discussing this with some of the colleagues yesterday, that Minir himself has migraine, and he noted himself. He noted that people with migraine often had symptoms similar to those of the young man. I don't hesitate to regard these migraines as dependent upon a lesion of the inner ear. They are accompanied by noises, by vertigo, by gradual diminution of hearing, and most often their deafness resists all methods of treatment. This is, this is wrote by Minir himself. He was believing that maybe migraine was caused by inner ear uh, lesions or something. But it's clearly uh, clarifies the relation between the migraine and the inner ear, uh, which would be considered. Just last week, we have in our clinic this interesting case we didn't publish. It was for a consultant uh, pulmonologist who uh, exhibit typical uh, migraineous attack, not associated with vertigo, but associated with fluctuant hearing loss and the tinnitus during his headaches. And this is what uh, the obtained audiograms with the more low frequency uh, sensory neural hearing loss. So just to keep in your mind that migraine uh, can mimic Meniere's disease, and there is with evidence that is in 50% of uh, the cases, there is association between migraine and Meniere's disease. Uh, Meniere wrote this inspiring phrases, if the physician has the patient interest at heart, he will be willing to consider new ideas and look for new answers. Let us, uh, let us give thanks to seeking spirits, to those with initiative who raise the questions of interest, stimulate active researches, provoke opposition, because in a world, science gains and the humanity applauds. Many wrote and published in the Gazette Medical in 1961, four or five papers, right up till the day before his unexpected death because of influenza pneumonia. Joseph Breuer, uh, he was based in Vienna in the Josephinium Hospital, something similar to the uh, previous Paris Hospital. Um, his, uh, Joseph Breuer is probably best known for his work with Sigmund Freud on hysteria. Uh, but he spent the most productive part of his scientific career working in the vestibular receptors of the inner ear. With the physicist Ernest Marsh, he developed the Marsh Brewer theory of semicircular canal function. He was the first to recognize that nystagmus resulted from endolymph flow within the semicircular canals and that the ambulatory nerve of a single canal could sense endolymph flow in both direction, means ambulobetal and ambulofugal. In 1874, his basic premise was that the semicircular canal sense angular movement of the head by movement of the fluid or the endolymph uh, within them. The endolymph moves relative to the walls of the canals because of its inertia. And because the three similar canals are approximately at right angles to each other, the canal sense movement in all possible planes. Within each semicircular canal, the sensory receptor is located in a bullous enlargement called the ambulla. And in dissecting the semicircular canals of Perdis, prior noted neural ending leading into the ambulla and the microscopic hair extending the endolymph from becular epithelial cells at the base. And you can see how accurately he could draw uh, 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 the ambulla uh, of the semicircular canal structure. The only thing that is the cilia uh, was short because of the post-mortem uh, changes. And by carefully studying the anatomy of the macules of fish, ribitals, and perdis, he concluded that linear head displacement or tilt is caused the autolithic membrane to slip bending the hair that project into it and thereby stimulating the underlying sensory receptors. And his shear theory 
of hair cell stimulation is a standard in modern textbook of vestibular physiology. That is the endolymph uh, uh, flow deflects the copula leading to the deflection of the hair cells. And this deflection of the hair cells or the shear movement causes opening of uh, the ion chains leading to action potential and uh, nerve impulses. Uh, per Kinji. Berkinji uh, uh, created the world's first independent department of physiology in uh, 1839 and the first official physiological laboratory known as the Physiological uh, Institute in 1842. And his contribution to the physiology of the vision, the oculomotor, and the vestibular system are well recognized. He described optokinetic nystagmus and optokinetic after nystagmus and by use of a rotary chair explained movements after effects as a habituation of the gaze motor system. Interestingly, the origin of the rotary chair that it was used as a treatment for the psychiatric patient and the schizophrenic patient. Say, the rotation and centrifugal was a non-treatment for psychiatric patients. So this is, was the origin of the rotary chairs. Uh, in these times, rotary chairs and centrifuges were used in the treatment of psychiatric patients. And despite his contribution to the physiology of the vestibular system, he, Berkinji didn't believe that there is receptors in the ear. He believed that there is some receptors in the brain which feel the uh, movement. And you can see here, this is the merry-go-rounds and those, uh, uh, the rotary chair which has been used to treat the psychiatric patients. Ernest Marsh, a physicist and a philosopher, one day he has a journey by the train. And uh, during the journey, the train was making a curve. So during the curve, he observed that the horizon become tilted in front of his eyes. This situation provoked his thinking and uh, got his interest to do more research in the vestibular system to understand the mechanisms. And uh, he has a famous book, it's called Fundamental of the Theory of Motion Perception. His experiments were mostly psychophysical and included measurement of threshold and visual vestibular interaction using a revolving chair uh, Marsh, as well as Joseph Breuer and Alexander Crumb Brown, all suggested that the parameter that is sensing during the rotation is acceleration. And they strongly supported the hypothesis that is the sensory organ is the labyrinth. And this is uh, how he uh, explains the tilt uh, uh, he felt during the uh, rotation by the uh, train, where is interaction between the centrifugation and interaction of the gravity. And uh, he could uh, uh, made a rotary chair, a wooden rotary chair, as you see, which he can do uh, the vertical axis rotation and also the off vertical axis rotation to test the autoless functions. Just keep the dates in your mind. Alexander Cram Brown, he was a chemist, and he, his contribution uh, is to the push-pull reciprocal mechanism of the semicircular canals. Uh, he wrote a famous paper on the sense of rotation and the anatomy and physiology of the semicircular canals of the inner ear in the Journal of Anatomy and Physiology in 1874. He came to conclusion about the function of the labyrinths that are still valid, the push-pull mechanisms of the semicircular canals. And here is uh, the model uh, uh, or uh, uh, simulation for the model he uh, used. That is the semicircular canal. One side is excited and the opposite side is inhibited. They work in a push-pull uh, or reciprocal fashion. Ewald, and I'm sure that most uh, of you are very familiar with his name because uh, Ewald's first, second, and third law. He was a German physiologist, and he did a nice experiment. In the semicircular canals of the pigeons, 
he make a hole in the semicircular canal, then he make a plug, your metal plug. And with the pneumatic rubber, he was, he could make a, like positive and the negative pressure, which he can induce ambulopetal and ambulofugal uh, endolymph flow. This is how he studied the uh, same circular canals of the pigeon. And he has three famous laws, which are the basics of uh, interpretation of the nystagmus up to the moment. His first law, that is low phase eye movement is in the direction of endolymph flow in the plane of the stimulated canal. Second law, ambulobetal flow is excitatory and ambulofugal, ambulofugal flow is inhibitory in the lateral canals. Third law, ambulofugal flow is excitatory and ambulofugal flow is inhibitory in the anterior and posterior canals. Pulitzer, and I think Dr. Pradeep going to present something in the uh, Pulitzer Society meeting. He was the father of the Austrian otology. And from his lab comes uh, Barani, Robert Barani, uh, the holder of the uh, Nobel Prize uh, in the medicine and physiology. So this is Robert Barani. He got his training with Pulitzer. And his story has, uh, is very rich story. At the age of 21, Barani had a, a re revelation. Um, after reading a book, he got inspired because he, he didn't believe that he's able to conduct innovative research. But after reading that book, he wrote, I wrote down only such ideas and thoughts I never read or heard about before. An immense of feeling of happiness flowed through me the entire day, and my confidence grew in an enormous way. I recognize that I'm capable of performing productive work to pursue new ways, independent of others. And I concluded I would devote myself from now on to the scientific research. Uh, during the World War I time, uh, war, Barani, despite he was suffering from ankylosing of the knee and he was limping, he volunteered as a civilian surgeon in the Austrian army. And he was giving care for the intracranial shots and the wounds. And this is uh, give him a further op opportunity to do some research into the cerebellum and the vestibular system. And uh, during the war, he had been uh, uh, captured by the Russian army and put in a prison in the uh, Central Asia. And uh, because he has a strong reputation, they give him they treat him exceptionally good and they put him as a director of the ENT services. Even he got some trainee, Russian trainee, uh, autologist to good training with him. And he was treating the Austrian soldiers as well as the uh, Russian soldiers. Interestingly, that is the news uh, about uh, winning the Nobel Prize came to him uh, during his prison time. Uh, he released by uh, interference by uh, the Prince of uh, Vienna and uh, he just received his Nobel Prize but unfortunately his joy was short-lived. Following his release he was accused of plagiarism by some of, of his Venice colleagues especially uh, Alexander, Joseph Alexander. And an investigation by the Karolinska Institute, which offers the Nobel uh, Prize, absolved him of the charges and they uh, ensured that he deserves the prize. And there was a joke during that time by in the newspaper, a cartoon in the Vienna newspaper uh, that is Barani is telling, I have succeeded in curing all kinds of ear injuries, but the deafness of the Vienna faculty those who accuse him of bigarism. Uh, because of uh, these problems, he has to leave Vienna and to go to uh, Sweden to become the chief of the autological service at the University of Uppsala. Uh, discovery of the chloric, it was uh, accidental, that is, uh, 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 
uh, by observation by one of his patients, he was doing uh, ear irrigation uh, for the waxing. Uh, then the patient, he told him, uh, I was saying, uh, doctor, I only get giddy when the water is not warm enough. When I do my own ears at home and use warm enough water, I never get giddy. So the next time, the nurse, uh, Barani's nurse, brought to him uh, hot water in the bowel. And when he syringed the patient here, he shouted, but doctor, this water is much too hot and now I'm giddy again. I, he, Barani is uh, telling, I quickly observed his eyes and noticed that the nystagmus was uh, in an exactly opposite direction from the previous one when cold water has been used. And it came to his mind that uh, the temperature of the water was uh, responsible of nystagmus. And uh, the labyrinth or the inner ear uh, now represented in my mind that the water heater uh, vessel filled with fluid, the temperature of this fluid is natural 37, the body temperature. And when I secured cold water at one side of the vessel, what must happen, what must naturally occur is that the water lying against uh, this wall is cooled down. In this way, it acquires a high specific gravity than the surrounding water and sinks to the bottom of the vessel. On the other hand, water still at body temperature takes its place. If I syringe the air with hot water, then the motion must be precisely contrary, but the motion of the fluid must be altered if I alter the position of the vessel. Uh, and it must be changed to the exact opposite if I turn it the vessel through 180 degrees. Uh, this is the basis of sometimes we do a caloric testing in the prone position. So especially in case when you have a strong spontaneous nystagmus. So if you want to get sure there is residual function of that labyrinth, just uh, um, do the caloric in subayan, but also do the caloric in prone position. So if the direction of the spontaneous nystagmus changes in the prone position, caloric irrigation that's usually uh, this labyrinth is still has functions. And this is uh, how he could explain the caloric stimulation of uh, the vestibular system and the basis of the caloric test. And as a clinician, Barani was immediately aware of the potential useful usefulness of the uh, water nystagmus or caloric test as a clinical test. It allowed the selective stimulation of each uh, horizontal semicircular canals. Because according to Breuer, he noted that is the physiological rotational stimulation activated both horizontal semicircular canals. This is um, very uh, nice. This is how Barani was teaching his students that you put your left hands and you put the right. So this is a represented the planes of the three semicircular canals. So I found it interesting to share. Uh, he did, the, he was, he has in his own clinic rotational test and for his rotational test, Barani uh, seated the patient on a swivel chair and he manually rotated the patient 10 times in 20 seconds and then suddenly stopped with the patient facing him. He measured the duration of post-rotatory nystagmus in each direction immediately after the chair was stopped. He found that the normal subject had an average duration of post-rotatory nystagmus of approximately 22 seconds, which is similar to the current velocity step test. This is a, a rotational chair from Barani. Uh, please note the dates. So, in his lab, the first case of PPV was uh, described. Uh, his assistant, Dr. Uh, his assistant showed him a 27 years old woman who developed the vertigo every time she lay on her right, uh, right side. Her only other symptoms was a recurrent headache during the past year. When Barani turned her onto her right side, she developed a strong rotatory torsional nystagmus to the right with a vertical component upwards, which when looking to the right was purely rotatory, and when looking to the left was purely vertical. This is a very practical point because the typical nystagmus of posterior canal BBV is the dissociate nystagmus. If the patient looked to the downmost ear, 
torsional and rotatory component will, may, will, uh, will uh, be more prominent. And if the patient looks to the upward uh, eye, his, uh, his vertical components, upbeating components become more prominent. And ideally, when you test a patient on, uh, on dexual bike test for BBV, ask the patient to keep the gaze on the uh, center uh, position. Uh, and you can see how accurate really they uh, describe uh, their case. The attack lasted about a half minute and was accompanied by severe vertigo and nausea. And if immediately after the end of an attack, the head was again turned to the right, no attack occurred. The patient had to lie for some time on her back or on left side in order to evoke a new attack. And this is clinically relevant um, that if you want to repeat the repositioning maneuver uh, for a patient, just give 10 minutes interval before retesting. And this is uh, his explanation for uh, the effect of gaze on the uh, posterior canal BBV nystagmus. He described what he calls Parani syndrome. Uh, on 1912, the syndrome consisted of episodes of vertigo, fluctuating hearing loss, occipital headaches, and a spontaneous outward past pointing error. Barani concluded that syndrome was probably related to migraine because most patients had migraine headaches for many years, and many patients had relatives with migraine. Uh, it's most probably equivalent to the basilar migraine. So, since the time of Parani and Dimineri's disease, they pay attention about the uh, relation of migraine into uh, the dizziness. Um, he's well known for his book, uh, The Physiology and Pathology of the Semicircular Canals. And you, if you Google, you find his uh, on the site of the Nobel, uh, uh, Nobel uh, Prize, you can find his uh, Robert Parani lecture uh, for uh, his Nobel Prize. Lorne Dino, a Spanish neurologist, he joined Parani. Uh, he worked with Parani for some years, and uh, both of them, they worked on the central vestibular system, and they have been the first to explain the vestibulo-ocular reflex and the three neuron arc pathway. And again, they explain the velocity storage mechanism. So, a lot of what we know now is known so many years, even they don't have the technology we have at the moment. Gustav Alexander, who has some conflict with Parani, they have been colleagues in the uh, Pulitzer uh, Clinic, uh, and he's very well known because of Alexander's law. Alexander's law. In 1912, Alexander's clinical experiments demonstrated that his spontaneous nystagmus of a patient with a vestibular lesion was more intense when the patient looked in the quick phase than in the slow phase direction. This phenomenon later became known as Alexander's law. Fortunately, I'm not a surgeon, and you know why, because uh, Gustav Alexander was tragically shot through the heart whilst walking in the street between his home and the polyclinic. The assailant was a former patient who bore a growth against Alexander after suffer suffering a facial deformity following an operation for saddle nose. So I am fortunate not to be a, a surgeon. Same patient, he tried to assassinate him 20 years earlier. Uh, but they catched him and put him in a sanatorium. He uh, stayed for 20 years, and when he came back, he shot uh, Gustav Alexander. Uh, Charles Holbaik, if you don't know, you know that he has been born in India, Mori, India in uh, uh, 19. You know that he was born in India, Charles Holbaik, or no? And you all know now the story, but he was born in India. And uh, his grandfather from his mother's side uh, was a, a commander in Skinner's horse. I think this is related uh, to the Indian army. 
And uh, this uh, church in Delhi was named uh, after the grandfathers from mother side of uh, Charles Holbeck. So Charles Holbeck, um, of course, he's an English otologist, but he has Indian roots. Um, he, he described and he made a model for the endolymphatic hydrops to explain the uh, mechanical uh, changes. And he did a standardization of the caloric testing with his work with uh, Fitzer Gerald. So both of them, they put the standard caloric test which we are using up till uh, now. And they uh, proposed uh, the formula to calculate uh, the caloric asymmetry and the formula to calculate the directional preponderance which is still used up till now. And uh, uh, he's well known uh, for uh, his uh, uh, Holbeck maneuver, which was by, uh, published by 1951, still used, and it is the standard uh, for testing the uh, BBV posterior canal. And this is how they uh, report it. The patient is laid supine upon a coach with his uh, just over its end, the head is then lowered about 30 degrees below the level of the coach and turn it some 30 to 45 to one side. In taking up this position, the patient first seated upon the coach with the head turned to one side and the gait fixed upon the examiner's forehead. The examiner then grasps the patient's head firmly between his hands and briskly pushes the patient back into the critical position. After a little interview of five to six seconds, the positional nystagmus begins. The onset of the nystagmus is nearly always preceded by an appearance of distress. The color may change. The patient may close their eyes, cry out in alarm, and they make active efforts to sit up again. At this point, it's necessary to reassure the patient and they maintain the position of the head. The nystagmus is mainly rotatory, the direction of rotation being towards the undermost ear. And interestingly, that he himself uh, designed and uh, uh, made a system for repositioning system uh, uh, like Omnix system or uh, TRV systems uh, just for those people with severe neck uh, cervical spine problems or severe neck problems. So just to do one block repositioning by moving the whole body. So what we see now is not new ideas. It has been designed and uh, manufactured and used by uh, Holbeck 60 years ago. So the maneuver is named Dix Holbeck. So Dix coming from Margaret Dix. And it takes me a long time to get a photo for Margaret Dix. Um, the co-author of uh, the Dix Holbeck maneuver with the Charles Holbeck. And you, know, you will know why it was very hard to get her photo. In 1937, she was appointed house surgeon and seemed set for a distinguished future in the profession as a surgeon. She was an outstandingly beautiful woman with fine features and sparkling eyes. But tragi uh, tragically, she suffered severe facial disfigurement after pumping uh, during uh, the World II uh, War in 1940. She was fortunate to be treated by great plastic surgeon and the great ophthalmologist, but fragments of, glasses, of glass, however, lodged in her eyes and prevented her from continuing her surgical career. Despite this, she completed her uh, fellowship uh, two fellowship, surgical and uh, medical, and she joined the Charles Horbike for uh, research position uh, at the Autological Research Unit at the National Hospital Square London, carrying out research on deafness in ex-surface men. This led her to a career in the neuroautology, investigating the diseases of the inner ear and its central nervous system pathway and uh, pioneering what, what was initially a new branch of medicine at that time. Her courage and determination were shown by her achievements and the distinctions. In her spare time, she was an accomplished painter and she enjoyed writing poetry, her own wartime experiences and those of her deaf mother 
made her especially sensitive to the needs of her patients, by whom she was universally admired and loved. Uh, Harold Schuchenschett, the American otologist, is the extraordinary otologic surgeon and the autopathologist and master of the temporal bone dissection. Uh, he uh, has great contribution to the ear surgeries, stabidectomy, tympanoblasty, labyrinthectomy. Uh, he did a great research on traumatic or news induced uh, hearing loss in animals. And with colleagues, he discovered different auditory pathways and he explained the pathology of the common vestibular disorders. He was born and lived his early years in a farming area. He used to work to be able to sponsor, to sponsor his education. Before residency training, he served two years as a general medical officer and two years as a flight surgeon with the 15th Air Force in the Mediterranean Theater in World War II. And he was awarded he was awarded the Soldier's Medal for his heroic rescue of a pilot who has trapped in a burning airplane. And he was a, a sober hero regarding his ability of hard work. And he's a uh, 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 author of the cobulolithysis theory. He postulated that a mechanical mechanism termed cobulolithysis of a benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. He argues that when the head is upright in organic particles detached from the autoconial layer by spontaneous degeneration of the head, trauma gravitate to and become settled on the cobula of the posterior canal which is situated directly inferior to the utricle. In fact, he found the basophilic deposits uh, precipitating on the cobula of the posterior canal in individual patients. This is uh, uh, deposits in the cobula from uh, autopsy. And uh, this is uh, in his uh, famous book, Basology of the Ear. This is the first description of the cobula size theory. And if you observe it that uh, in the original theory, uh, the autoconia is on the utricular side, but there was some uh, mistakes in this drawing, which was corrected and the next copy of the book. Uh, he put correctly the uh, position of the utricle uh, uh, relative to uh, the copula of the uh, posterior canal. Uh, he was with the Ketomora, the first to, to describe the vestibular neuritis, uh, pathology of the vestibular neuritis, because they found some atrophy of uh, uh, the vestibular nerves. Uh, and he also explained very well the blood supply of the inner ear. And just I mentioned in comment, this is crucial to be known to any clinician working with the disease patient. The blood supply of the inner ear comes from the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, which is a branch of the basilar artery, which an artery from the posterior circulation of the brain. So any condition which might compromise the blood supply to the posterior circulation can affect the uh, inner ear, especially the internal auditory artery, uh, 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 pass through bony canals with some bony spikes uh, at some uh, positions, and it has no collaterals. So they are very sensitive to ischemia. And he uh, draws a uh, endolymphatic uh, hydrops model and uh, explanations. Uh, and he is uh, known for his uh, great textbooks, uh, The Pathology of uh, the Ear. Joseph McClure, and um, I, uh, I like that uh, Cyclops system bought McClure Bagnini uh, test, uh, not uh, subine role test. Because actually, uh, the role plane is. Uh, not the one we test is the horizontal canal. Uh, um, we, uh, so the correct, it's better to call it uh, McClure Bagnini test. Uh, he was in Western Ontario, uh, University of Canada, and uh, his contribution includes a uh, same circular canal model, canalithesis theory, horizontal canal BBV and the McClure Bagnini uh, test for examination of the horizontal canal. And you, as you can see here, by 1979, they published uh, to explain the mechanism of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And at that time, again, they designed a model for the semicircular canals using a bottle of water, anterior canal, posterior canal with mercury 
the Mercury represents the autoconia. Uh, I was planning to bring with me a model designed by a uh, Japanese company. Uh, it's exact model based on uh, a structure CT uh, temporal bone information from normal people. So you have a model of the semicircular canals, uh, utricle and saccule with the autoconia in red color moving in this transparent. I use it frequently for counseling my patient. Uh, unfortunately, I forget to bring it with me, but uh, using a model for counseling the patient is a good idea, and I found it really very beneficial to counsel the patient about the pathology of the PBV and about the treatment uh, options or methods for PBV. Uh, so he created the model, Lauren uh, Parents, still uh, practicing in uh, Western Ontario. I'm just here. He was the first to uh, report about uh, using the posterior canal occlusion for, uh, for intractable benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And he did something of value that uh, he captured uh, through the surgical microscope uh, the, uh, how the autolith or the autoconia in the semicircular canal and after touching it, how it uh, became fragmented. So that was uh, a, a, a proof for uh, the canalysis uh, theory. So all the key information for understanding the mechanism of BBV was known early in the 20th century, but it was not until near the end of the century until a cure was uh, discovered. The first treatment was uh, published by Brandit and Darov and both of them still in practice. Uh, Brandit from Germany, Darov from uh, United States. And I'm sure you know the brand of Darov exercises. Then later on coming uh, Simont, Alin Simont, uh, a physical therapist, French physical therapist, who uh, published his uh, maneuver. Uh, then John Ibley, uh, who by uh, 1992, I guess, published his uh, uh, well-known Ibley maneuver. So the lessons we learn from uh, this very rich history uh, and the dynamic history of our speciality or uh, our area of interest. That is vestibular medicine has come to us on the shoulders of giant physicians and scientists. Each of them is a real inspiration. Deep understanding of vestibular physiology is mandatory for successful therapy of different disorders. It is our responsibility to continue the clinical and research work in this field. And thank you very much. Thanks.